Hey everyone, the following recording I did on July 28th, 2019 with JD from ubfreedom and private-person.com forward slash blog. I had been listening to uh, JD's material for quite some time when I invited him to have a conversation with me concerning uh, the similarities between law in America and law in Canada. JD is in Canada and he has been gaining experience in law and the legal system, uh, including a lot of court time for a number of years. And what I appreciate is JD's very objective approach to trying to navigate a very complex system. Um, I would say every bit as complex in Canada as the United States with differences and with similarities. So that was the point of this interview was to just try to discuss similarities in terminology, um, in procedure, in how to read symbols and uh, lettering in documents and so on. Um, I personally really enjoyed this talk and I asked JD after this was done if in the future I had a more specific objective because believe me we did cover the objective I had in mind and and I thought it was personally I thought it was very enlightening uh, if he'd be willing to come on again and uh, he said just send me an email so uh, perhaps down the road I'll have the pleasure of having another uh, conversation uh, a more specific one with JD so until then I hope everybody enjoys this interview and I hope you get a lot out of it. So without any further ado. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of my interview series, which uh, for some time was the Sunday special live. But since YouTube is changing some things with their software and, and Google Hangouts, uh, we're going to do most of everything uh, on a, a pre recorded uh, basis. Today, uh, I have with me. Uh, somebody who I've been listening to for, for a long time and reading his blog, and I find it fascinating uh, since I, uh, amongst other things, spend as much time as I can uh, reading and, and researching law and the foundation of law in the United States where I live and in the state of Indiana where I live uh, and abroad. Uh, because I find that um, really the nature of the system that all of us seem to get entangled in, in one form or another, whether we want to or not, uh, seems more and more universal the more you look at it in more locations. Uh, so uh, this guest is in Canada. And uh, I had heard some webinars and other conversations that he had had with various people. And I thought to myself, you know, there's, there's so many things he's saying that seem to, based on what I know about law in the US and in Indiana, um, sound like they, they really cross over the, the, the borders, even though Canada has a, a different type of constitution and legal system and laws than the US, it does seem that we have many similarities. So I asked him if he would, he would like to come on. He recently on his uh, blog page, which is uh, private-person.com forward slash blog, he, he did a brief blog and video on a private person in the US. It's something that he has Put a lot of time into. Uh, there's a lot of material he has on this as a status. Um, and even though I'm no expert, he's going to talk far more eloquently on these things than me. I know this is something that we're going to approach and perhaps the sort of, maybe we can get to some uh, every man's solutions 
to different lawful and legal problems that everybody ends up in when they're least expecting it. So I would like to welcome uh, JD from UB Freedom and as I said, from private-person.com forward slash blog. Thanks for getting with me today, JD. Oh, my pleasure. Looking forward to having a chat about uh, what we're talking about. Excellent. So yeah, like like we said in uh, in initial correspondence, uh, when I approached you, I said, you know, I I know that uh, there's there's obviously some differences, um, especially in uh, minutia of, of language and 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 probably certain definitions, which would be a bit different in Canadian law or maybe uh, BC law than they would be in US or, or Indiana law. Um, but then I, I believe that you said, you know, there, there were a lot of similarities as well. Um, and I had mentioned somebody that I had learned a lot from as far as just simple procedure for <clears throat> handling about any kind of, of court appearance you might have. Uh, it was Howard Freeman. You said that that you might not have been familiar with him. And what he did was he just taught this, this really simple sort of procedure in establishing jurisdiction um, because of the, the jurisdiction that courts in the United States, at least, are secretly operating under. Um, and I, what I was hoping is that you know, you would talk a little bit about um, the importance of establishing that status of private person. Now, I know in your blog, when you checked on private person and natural person, you, you found a, a difference. And I looked into that myself in the U.S. And it appears that natural person is the, uh, the desired um, title, I guess, for the same thing as private person would be in Canada. Um, but yeah, I was hoping that maybe we could, we could see if there's some common ground there, um, where people who, you know, get in, entangled in something legal that maybe took them by surprise, um, can understand and, and know and have some kind of a, a, a good bearing on where they're at, what's going on. And, and the best things they could do uh, in order to protect themselves from predators, really. That, that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I didn't um, want to leave you short. Sure. Uh, the way I work with my, my research and the way I try and view things is from principles. If you look at the foundational principles that things are created on, then you're more likely to extrapolate that into something that is correct. If you are wrong in your principles in some way, or you don't understand the principles, it's much easier to get off track and end up um, making mistakes or wrong interpretations or wrong conclusions that you know end up wasting a lot of time and in some cases actually causing harm. Mm -hmm. So everything I try and cover starts with looking for the principle and the foundation. Where did things start? How did they start? And then you begin there. Many people will hear an idea, but it's four or five, six steps away from a principle. And yeah. they don't understand those different levels beneath what they're studying. And so they don't know what they're studying is correct because they don't know if the principles it's built on are correct or not. So I encourage people, whatever they're studying is uh, good information and good process to go through and identify the principles in what you're looking at find the sources of those principles, try and confirm those principles, and see if those principles actually match up with the theory or the idea or the concept that you're studying. Because if they don't match up, then there's something wrong with theory. And there's an old, uh, an old story about, you know, if you're going from the earth to the moon, and let's not get into that, uh, <laughs> that theory about it, but if you're going yeah. there and you're one degree off when you leave the earth, you're going to be, you know, a million miles off by the time you get to the moon. So just yeah. a small course correction, a small difference at the beginning makes a big difference at the end. So um, when I did I that first... going to Wyoming once. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. that too but with the roads kind of keep you on pat on track right whereas in in the realm of uh words ideas laws concepts theories ethics whatever it's there are no roads <laughs> <laughs> And you're you you're trying so, yeah you're you're trying to find the foundation that a building is built on, and then you know go from there. But uh, with regard, starting off with one of your questions uh, near the beginning was the distinction between natural person and private person. Now yeah. many people have um, over the years taught that person is a corporation and only a corporation can't be anything but a corporation. Anybody teaching the word person as a good thing is a bad person. <laughs> right. So, I've been called names and I've been attacked for teaching private person because I'm 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 part of the system trying to entrap people is what they say, mm. but they don't understand what I'm teaching because they've never studied it. They just go, somebody else told me person was a corporation and I can go to a legal dictionary and I can see in the definition of the word person in a legal dictionary, oh yeah, I can see that corporation is there. But what they ignore, what? what they what they avoid, what they forget, what they're blind to is the fact that corporation is only one of five, six, or seven definitions of the word person. Right. And it's not the first one. The primary mm -hmm. one is always a man. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other uses it can have in law, one of them being corporation. So mm -hmm. person is not exclusively only a corporation. That's the default that the system uses the vast majority of the time, yes. But mm -hmm. uh, even if you're using the word person, you have to find the context, you have to find the, the definitions for what you're looking at, because just because it says it in the dictionary doesn't mean that's what it means in an act. You have to actually look in the act to see if it's been redefined from what the dictionary says. Sure. So there's this process of, of getting clear on the definition of the word, which, you know, with your uh, background in languages and stuff is what it's all about. It, it's yeah. what does it really mean is the first step. The second step, what is it being used as today in today's vernacular? Has it changed its meaning for everyday usage? So mm -hmm. it now has a new meaning. Well, you know, I'm, you know, bad means good these days. Yeah. You know, it's the bomb. Well, I don't, I don't know, but bombs are bad things. They blow people up. But if it's the bomb, it's a good thing. So, you know, a lot of words are being changed and we no longer know what the original meaning is. And so yeah. when the person's using it, we have to understand which context do they mean it? Do they mean as a good or a bad? Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a comedy show. It was a bomb. Does that mean it was bad bomb or good bomb? Well, you know, <laughs> it's good to know. So um, that's the first thing, thing, the word person. The past is that courts, and this is the same in the, in the U.S., you know, they can't recognize you if you're not appearing in a status that is recognizable whether it be a fiction or not there's it's based on a fact and and the legal definitions of person even say that you know even something fictional has to have a natural person behind it representing it there has so you have to at no, least the, the, nat the natural the natural person creates it right okay yeah. and then uh, then a representative not necessarily the natural person represents it so the two are not necessarily the same Mm -hmm. And the distinction secondarily beyond person is the distinction between private person and natural person. Why mm -hmm. are there two terms that mean uh, virtually the same thing but not? Mm -hmm. Well, we live in a world of multiple uh, legal systems, one being common law, one being civil law, like French civil law, Scottish civil law, uh, Louisiana mm -hmm. civil law, Quebec civil law. But common law is around all of that. And then you have Sharia law and other types of law. But if we just stop and look at civil law and common law, because it's an interesting marriage, mm -hmm. every common law country has one civil law state in it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, how'd that work? Why does that, why does it work that way? Well, if you're trying to um, take over the legal system and corrupt the legal system and you mix two very dissimilar systems. Civil law and common law are basically opposites of each other. Mm. And, and you put this, these two opposites together, you're going to end up having them bleed across. And you're going to end up having people who want to manipulate the system using uh, the beneficial things in one system uh, in order to control the whole. That's the way I view it. Because a yeah. uh, private person exists only and exclusively in common law. It does not exist and is not recognized in a civil law uh, system mm -hmm. and that's because of the word private so private modifies the word person 
you're no longer now talking about just a person, you're talking about a specific type of person, a private person, which gives a specific context. And private right, privacy rights and property rights around privacy do not exist in civil law. Mm. And so you have to look at the fact that you have these two opposing systems effectively and how they have been blended together in a way that causes even more confusion. So in Canada, there was uh, something set up by the federal government back in the uh, 90s, I think it was, where it was called the bi-jural terminology uh, process. Bi-jural, two jurisdictions. So you have the federal government in Canada is now uh, writing laws that are supposed to be applicable in Quebec, which is civil law, and yeah. in the rest of Canada, which is common law. And the same thing for the states. you got Louisiana, which is civil law, and then you got the rest of the U.S. is common law. So right. the Fed said, well, in order for us to write a law that is equally applicable and can be read the same in Quebec as well as the rest of Canada, we need to find words that are exclusively common law and change them so that they're also applicable in civil law. And so this is where they settled on the term natural person, because natural person can be effectively the same as a private person at common law. And natural person is the recognized man in uh, a civil law system. But it's a different system where in civil law, you have the rights basically derived from government command. You're allowed to do what the government says in common law, whereas in civil, excuse me, in civil law, whereas in common law, it's the opposite. The rights, you naturally have all the rights and they can only be taken away from you um, under certain circumstances in common law. So it's a reverse right. power structure in civil law and common law. And mm -hmm. what I've heard about lawyers is they learn very little common law in common law systems. They're right. mostly learning civil law procedures. And the lawyers who come out of Quebec have to be taught common law because they have to deal with the common law aspects of the federal government and the other provinces. So we actually have supposedly better educated common law people in Quebec than we do in the rest of Canada. So it's basically the same way in the U.S. Yes. From what I've been told, they're, they're taught a lot of procedure in law school. Yes. Um, but, you know, common law and then all of the intricacies between now in the U.S., it's you have common law, you have um, – uh, well, you naturally have civil law, but then you have your your equity uh, in this jurisdiction, of course, but, you know, equity and admiralty and all that. But most attorneys don't know about those things. Um, they know a lot about procedure. Right. And procedure basically is the civil law process. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you just teach procedure, you don't have to learn the principles. And then you don't know when you're violating principles because you never learned the principles. Mm hmm. So it becomes a default system of you just go through this process. We don't understand why or what it's about. We just do the process. And, and people go, well, we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so nobody's, no, nobody's looking at uh, what are the rights that are being infringed, which is what you see all the time in, in the news and in, in, in uh, court decisions. People go, well, what about my rights? Well, sorry, you know, that doesn't count. Well, why not? And the big question for me became, you know, uh, about this status of private person, because in Canada, um, personally, I've, I've got over 200 hours in court easily, probably more mm -hmm. like 500 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done natural person and private person in court making the claim of that status. I've been threatened. I've been intimidated. I've had the sheriff come out and escort me. Um, I have uh, friends who have uh, done the same thing. They've been arrested in court. They have a warrant uh, uh, issued for them and they're arrested later. I had one fellow taken from the courtroom to the back, brought out later on and uh, the judge goes, well, have you learned your lesson, lesson yet? And he maintains the status of a natural person. The judge goes, guess not, and sends him away again for a psych evaluation. <laughs> so they're, they're using very uh, intense um, attacks on people who are claiming that status. And if you understand how intimidation works is when you're close to the right thing, they ramp up the intimidation mm -hmm. in order to get you off it. So there's lots of evidence uh, that natural person, private person are things they don't want to touch and don't want to deal with. And the question becomes why? Well, 
there's lots of research around that. There's lots of good research uh, in the states that people are doing about reclaiming your status. So uh, my initial uh, website was this uh, private person uh, website, and the idea was that first the stat the status exists. It is recognized. It is in the law. It is in even though the bi-jural terminology in federal government Canada when they brought in this thing, they said, private person is obsolete, so now we're going to use natural person. But mm -hmm. if you search federal legislation in Canada, you find out they're still using private person in very specific legislation. Well, mm -hmm. what's specific about that legislation? It deals with property. And so you have going, well, they can't even avoid the use of private person in this instance because they can't take away the rights that are associated with that instance. And mm -hmm. what you talked about with the blog uh, post recently, that was actually a 2013 blog post uh, where I went to the U.S. laws and I did a search for natural person to see how many instances there were and private mm -hmm. person. And they both come up far more natural person because so many laws have been written that way. But they can't eliminate private person entirely because there's specific rights there that they can't get rid of. Yeah. And recently had a fellow send me an email uh, from the States with his research on private person with regards to an interpretation. And that's why that 2013 post got reposted is because I updated it. If you read down okay. the bottom of the post, you see the update, you'll see the research he sent me and you'll see my response to it. And the idea that he found an example of private person that appeared to be a corporation. And so I went through the process of uh, interpretation and uh, statute definitions and showed him that in this act, this word private, this term private person has been defined this way, but it's only limited to this act and this mm -hmm. section of the act. It's not to everything. So uh, you have to be careful of the context at all times. And uh, I did the same thing for the UK. Somebody, I don't know, six months, eight months ago uh, said, what about private person in the UK? And I thought, well, I'd never searched UK statutes. So I went and did that. And I did a post on the UK. Every common law country will have private person in their statute because they can't get rid of it. Every Everyone will have natural person because they can't get rid of it. And as you mm -hmm. already stated, the only person who can start a corporation is a natural person. Yeah. Right. And the natural person, uh, what they've done in Canada anyways, is municipalities and cities across the country have been getting natural person status equivalency. So through a statute, they're saying, you know, this municipality now has the status of a natural person of full capacity. But it's granted through statute power. It doesn't have it inherently, whereas yeah. we have it inherently. Right. Well, why are they giving it to a, a municipality? Because we have unlimited rights and they're trying to give more rights to the municipalities than they were able to do through statute. Mm -hmm. So there's always more rights attached to a natural person than a private person. The question is, how do they get us out of that status? What's the trick? What's the game? What's the process to get us out of that status and, and get us to voluntarily ultimately waive our full, full capacity status? Correct. And then operating in a diminished status, which is what everybody's doing all the time without having a clue. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, in the in the U.S., um, I know um, be, because of the, the, the various different uh, types of, of laws and it's separated in Canada, it's a, it's a little different than the U.S. So here um, you, you go into a court. And everybody's got the idea from movies and TV that um, law is law. And if they get summoned into court or if they get arrested and hauled into court, um, that it's all just law. Um, and most people don't understand the difference of jurisdiction and how judges take silent judicial notice of things and if you don't call out um, certain factors that uh, qualify where you are, who you are, and what you're doing, um, they will just proceed essentially in the United States with admiralty law or statutory law based on uh, the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, and you have no rights and people wonder, you know, where are my rights under the Constitution? Well, um, they were there 
but you have to um, you have to claim them and you have to do it on the record and you have to establish jurisdiction. And if you don't do these things and you just uh, go along with the process, well, silence is consent. Um, and at least that's the way it works in U.S. courts. And I'm assuming to a certain degree that that's the same in Canada. Every Commonwealth country and yeah. the U.S. It, ultimately, the U.S. is a former Commonwealth country. That is, they're all based on the same legal system. Everything came from the common law of the U.K. And yeah. so the exact same game, the exact same process with minor, minor uh, differences based on like some legal structure stuff. But uh, yeah, it's ultimately the same process and the same game in every Commonwealth. Absolutely. Well, in, in the U.S., for instance, the Magna Carta is still considered law. You can still use that as long as you are in an established common law jurisdiction, if that's been established. And, and you can even use it to get to um, that jurisdiction is pointing out um, points in the Magna Carta. So, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, everything that, that was I, I'm, I'm assuming Magna Carta is still uh, a basis for law in Canada and other Commonwealth countries, correct? Everyone, yeah. It, and yeah. there are people who argue it's not even valid law. So, you know, there's all sorts of arguments that people are making about uh, even things like that not being valid because of the way it was created and things that happened afterwards and so on. So there's sure. all sorts of ideas out there um, about that. Now, my take on the, on the court system is that uh, the court is there as, as a neutral box. And two mm -hmm. parties come into the neutral box. And the first party uh, who starts the suit is the one who defines the law that the court is going to be administrating. Okay? Because it's on your lawsuit that you're making your claim. Well, mm -hmm. I'm making this claim uh, under this law. Well, is it a statute law? Is it a common law claim? Is it uh, an admiralty claim? Is it whatever? The judge will administer whichever law you bring to them. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Many people don't understand that the judge reacts to the party bringing the suit. It's not the judge who is is the law or determines mm -hmm. the law. It's the party bringing the suit that determines the law. Now, mm -hmm. the question is, does the judge just go along with it? And, you know, most of the time the judge just goes along with it. But mm -hmm. the person responding to the suit has the opportunity to challenge what the party bringing the suit uh, is doing and how they're doing it by challenging the jurisdiction uh, that they're bringing to the court or the fact they're not subject to the jurisdiction of the law they're bringing to the court or various mm -hmm. other things. And then the judge, as effectively should be a neutral third party, then looks at that and then makes a decision on that. So yeah. uh, many people put judges uh, into the position of the ones who run the whole show, uh, and they do to a degree, but they're not the ones who set the court. It's the party bringing the suit that sets the court. And the Which is why the bur burden of proof would be on them to, to prove jurisdiction, to, you know, prove yes. statuses and things like that. You always put that proof on them, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. The fundamental principle of you're, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Well, you also don't have jurisdiction until it's either admitted or accepted. And mm -hmm. if it's challenged, then it's proven uh, mm -hmm. or has to be proven. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, because and I make a distinction between uh, politically motivated suits and everyday suits, um, there's a variety of everyday suits. You know, John and Jane have a fight. They go to court. The judge doesn't care. It's just two parties fighting over something. He makes a decision without playing political games. But if it's the state bringing an individual to the court, now it has political consequences. And the judge may be guided by other unseen policies that we don't know mm. and uh, that, uh, you know, they want a specific outcome, like in, you know, tax yeah. evasion cases, for instance, you know, yeah. the judge's job is to convict. And yeah. he knows that and he's going to play the game because that's what you do uh, when the state brings that type of thing before him. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's other things. There's lots of issues with uh, child protection services being you know, seriously flawed process and judges seem to be going along with it, which, you know, they should not be doing. Yeah. So there's lots of problems in that regard. But like I said, I see it as there's politically state related uh, cases, which will be manipulated uh, considerably. And then there's regular everyday cases, which probably flow fairly normally. And one of the reasons for that is 
you know, like going to a casino, if nobody ever wins, nobody will go to play. Mm -hmm. You have to have the appearance of fairness enough times for people to still have faith and trust in the system to some degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there has to be a, a, a fair play uh, aspect to it. Otherwise, yeah. you know, the, no, there is no credibility and then it has no power. Yeah. And they tend to, uh, you know, in the U.S., what they what they tend to do um, is give cases. And I've been in the courtroom more times than I ever wanted to be. I, I had a very sordid past a long time ago. And so I observed all of this and never really understood it until more recently. But it does seem that they will, as I said, they can they can silently basically sort of toggle. Uh, as you said, you didn't say the toggle thing, but um, you know, the, the party bringing suit they're they're saying right there on your paperwork, and I'm I'm just referring to guys who have been hauled into county jail. They they go for their first appearance. They get their paperwork. It says right there, essentially what j sort of jurisdiction? What is that? Is that actually a law? Is that a statute? W you know what is what am I being charged with? Um, and what they'll tend to do is they will seamlessly go from a case that is statutory, that's just based on code, to a case that is based on common law. And both the prosecution and the judge will switch from one to the other so seamlessly that if you're not paying attention, if you don't understand what's going on, you'll have no idea what you ought to do, you know, when you're up to bat, which has been the case with most people I've ever known and myself. Yeah. And what they'll also do is they'll be prosecuting a uh, statute case and then they'll justify it with common law. So yeah. they're actually mixing the legal systems in order to justify an action in one, which really shouldn't be justified in that manner. Right. So, yeah, they'll, they'll mix and match to their heart's content uh, if they have a specific outcome that they want. Yeah. And I mean, most cases that I have ever witnessed and everyone pretty much, I guess, that I've ever been in. Uh, except for one, I think I was once in a, a very small little civil thing, and it was it was I mean not even worth mentioning it was, but the uh, it, it has all been at that level of passing off statutory law as criminal law, um, and I I. I swear to you, in all the years that I, I was getting in trouble, would go to jail, uh, would have to go before a judge, uh, nobody I knew, and I mean not one, and this is hundreds of people that I met, that I talked to, understood that they were being uh, brought in under a jurisdiction that was unknown to them. Um, the the procedure that I was taught, and I, I, I've never had the opportunity to try this, and I hope I, I never have it, but um, is so, you know, in a in a U.S. Indiana court, you, it, let's say that you were picked up on something that happens to be a code violation. You didn't actually deprive someone of their rights, um, and you, you go in there, and they're going to call your name, um, and this is just basically the system of, of Howard Freeman that I'm talking about. And then maybe what you can do is is tell me, now does that sound about right? And where does your status come in in all this? Um, and they would call your name uh, and you would affirm, okay, that's my name. Um, and then the prosecution will have to read the charge and they will actually give the statute number and all of that. They will say what it is. And then the judge will turn to you and say, did you understand the charge? And that is where Howard Freeman <laughs> uh, recommends that you always say no. Um, and the reason being is that uh, in, in U.S. Indiana courts, you cannot be, uh, you can't be tried. They can't go forward if you do not have understanding of the charge. Uh, and it would be at that point that you would um, state from the Constitution, Indiana State Constitution, it's Article 1, Section 13 A and B, um, that you have the right to uh, know the nature and cause of the charge being brought against you, and is it civil or criminal? Of course, they'll never say it's civil because then you can move to have the, uh, the case dismissed. They're going to tell you it's criminal. There's two types of uh, criminal jurisdictions, or, or sorry, um, 
there's two types of, of criminal law allowed. There's uh, common law and basically admiralty law. Uh, well, that, they, do, they do have a category which the statutes operate under almost all the time, which is called quasi-criminal. Which, quasi -criminal. Means it's a, which means it's a civil crime prosecuted under criminal uh, rules. Mm -hmm. So when they say that they're prosecuting under, it's criminal, but they're not telling you is it's really quasi-criminal. It's a form of criminal, but it's not criminal. I see. So this is part of the word game uh, where they mix. That's and, a new one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was wow. actually the first court case I was in. I learned that one, you know, firsthand. Because oh, uh, I made yeah. I made those inquiries cri criminal criminal or civil and the judge goes no it's quasi criminal oh okay and then you go and you do your research right yeah so that's how, that's how they that's how they play the game it's criminal when it's not because it's quasi well what's quasi mean what's the definition of quasi you're a word guy <laughs> yeah you, you know that's something that I picked up I believe from from listening to you is uh, there was a guy you talked about a guy who would ask the definitions of every single word. If yeah. the judge would would give him a word, he would ask, "What is the definition?" And he was what on the stand. He he was on the stand and in the witness box when when he did that, and yeah. and the, the prosecutor complained about it, the fact that he was you know being obstructionist by asking for definitions all the time. The judge's response was, "Well, I think he's being being very prudent to make sure that he understands uh, what word what the word means before he answers." You know, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah. Ultimately, that comes back to your comment earlier, but I don't understand the charges. If you don't understand, um, you know, that causes a problem. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing is when you make, make statements like that, I don't understand. They'll just many times these days just roll over you and just proceed anyway. Because mm -hmm. your lack of understanding only becomes an issue upon appeal. And 99% yeah. of the people are never going to appeal because they, they're emotionally worn out, financially, you know, can't deal with it, etc. And yeah. so all the flaws and process uh, abuses that occur um, just disappear uh, because they're on the record, but nobody appeals the record. So now, unless unless I'm mistaken, um, if you stick to your guns though as you go, and you do not agree to play their game, to be part of their system, um, they could steamroll you, but then you do have some sort of recourse uh, to that. Yeah, Is that correct? Uh, it's, Typically. It's, it's, it's making your record, objecting all the way along. One of the things I said after my first uh, first trial process was I wasn't objectionable enough. Mm -hmm. What I meant by that was I should have objected more because if you don't say I object on the record, you can't point to it later and go, see, I didn't agree. I said it, you know, like it, many times it's like, well, your, your brain is going, what just happened? I don't understand. That's not right. And then it, you, you just move it along. And mm -hmm. if you don't speak up and say, no, that's wrong, I object to that, and put it on the record, if you appeal later on, you can, every time you object it and the judge overrules your objection, that's an appeal point. So you need, you, need <laughs> to make, you need to make a record of everything you object to so that you can point to each one of the objections and you can say the judge, uh, uh, the judge um, did not respect my rights. Uh, with that objection because the judge should have done this and the judge decided differently. And mm. so every objection forces the judge to make a decision. Every decision is an appealable point. So how many That's appealable points do you want to make? That's excellent yeah. to know. Uh, just as, as, the, as you've said in the past, um, uh, concerning filing complaints um, when your rights are abused, uh, put it on the record. Put yeah. that, what did they do? What did they do to you? What's wrong? Put that, because that's what's going to happen. I mean, um, not not just Freeman, but most people I would say are trustworthy, uh, have said that. Hey, we, we can give you a good system and you could probably teach anybody very good systems and principles of law, but once they get in the courtroom, depending on, on <laughs> who the judge is, what kind of a, a morning they've had, um, you know, things that are unseen to you, um, you might get, even though you make every good, right, correct move as you go, you might still get it, your rights entirely trampled and end up in jail or, or whatever. Um, and 
you want to have recourse. And that's something that, that so many of us are steamrolled by when we don't know anything. We don't understand that. We don't understand that we have rights to object, that if the judge is even patronizing or coarse or cruel to us, that we can object and put on the record for ourselves what it is they are doing, um, which we believe, even if it's, it's not true, which we believe is infringing upon our rights. At least it's on the record. Absolutely. And there's even a process called uh, a motion for recusal of the judge. So it's a motion to recuse for reasonable apprehension of bias. That's the official term in Canada anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's similar in the States where you make a record of each one of your objections, each time that they talked down to you, each time they yelled at you, each time they pointed and, you know, because that's the thing, I object to the way that you're looking at me, right? You know, you're, you're, and the way you're pointing at me, I object to the tone of your voice. You have to object to everything because if it can't be read on a piece of paper, it did not happen. Doesn't exist. So you, have to, you have to describe what you're seeing, hearing, and feeling. I find what you're doing to me very intimidating right now. I object. That yeah. goes on the record, on a piece of paper, which you order the transcripts, and it becomes the basis for your complaint about the judge. So mm -hmm. you can do a motion to the judge, which is really funny, where you're saying to the person, that you're trying to get removed, they decide whether they should be removed or not. So, you know, kind of like, <laughs> how does that work? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you make this list of, of things that they've done, the way they've infringed your rights or misbehaved or treated you badly or whatever, mm -hmm. and you make a motion for them to recuse. They listen to everything and they go, well, I can see, the, it's called a reasonable man test. Would a reasonable man sitting here in court watching this possibly consider that the judge may have been biased just by what he heard and saw the judge doing. That's the reasonable man test. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the judge has to step back from themselves and go, geez, if somebody else watching me, you know, heard me and saw me do, doing this stuff, uh, could they think I was biased? Well, if I think they might think I could be biased, then yes, I have to recuse myself. It's rare for a judge to actually recuse themselves on that basis unless yeah. it's really obvious. But I've done, two, of us. <laughs> I've, done two, I've done two of those applications and I've coached a few uh -huh. others to do them. And what it does is it puts the judge on notice. It puts the system on notice mm -hmm. that you're not going to take any crap and that you're going to put it on the record. And you either treat me with respect and you follow the process properly or you're going to get this on your record. Yeah. And uh, it's the same thing with lawyers. Anytime the lawyers do anything wrong, if you don't complain about it, they don't get a black mark on their record. So when somebody actually put that does, on the record too, right? You put Prosecutor, it on the record. Or anybody is yep. treating you improperly in courtroom. You make sure let the record show. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, even after outside of the court, every every government agency, organization, and uh, um, commercial enterprise uh, has a complaint process. So if, a, if you're mistreated by anybody, they have a complaint process for you to go through to complain about them. The law associations have a complaint process to complain about lawyers. It's all online, and that's part of what is covered in uh, this website here, which is how to complain against the system and how to lay claims against the system. This is suewrongdoers.com. The yeah. idea being that if we don't complain and claim against these people who are harming us and harming others, then they get to continue to do it with impunity. And so I've read cases where a, a lawyer has had a complaint against them. And you read the decision of the, of the board that reviews the case. And they basically have a mini trial uh, that held by the law association and mm -hmm. to find out whether he's guilty of this, this infringement. And one of the first things they talk about is how many complaints this guy already had. Mm -hmm. Well, since nobody complains, the worst lawyers, the first review they get, well, he's never had any complaints, so he must be an okay guy. Yeah. Well, what would happen if everybody who got ripped off, abused, mistreated, overbilled, whatever, uh, complained about it? A lot more lawyers would have a lot harder time um, justifying their behavior when they have two, three, four, five complaints. You get multiple complaints, lawyers lose their insurance. Well, they you know where I'm insurance. from? Where I'm from, if more, if 10% of the people complained, uh, that would completely clear out the public defender's office. Yeah. And so criminality <laughs> continues in our system, in our society. Yeah. 
because people don't take on the common law role of uh, reporting criminal behavior or wrongdoing of whatever level. And if you think about it, um, it's even biblical in nature in that you go to your brother and you say, this is the problem. Mm. This is what happened. This is how you made me feel. This is the damage that was caused. Will you do something to fix it? Will you apologize? Mm. Will you pay for it? Whatever it is. And if they do not do something about it positively, that's when you go and you do a, a complaint. And mm. if the complaint doesn't work out for you, then there's a legal claim that you can do through the courts because the bar associations, just like all you know, insiders protect their own and they're not necessarily going to find their own guilty, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat. Right. So that's why you also have the court system as a, you know, third step. And really the courts are considered the last resort. And yet for many people they are the yeah. first resort. Yeah, they should be. Right. And the court and the court operating properly, honorably, the first question they should ask to the person bringing the suit is, did you try and settle this privately first? That's what they're supposed to do. Sometimes yeah. you see them doing it, but most of the time they don't. If that person says, I have not tried, I have not gone to this person, tried to settle it privately, the judge's job is to say, go outside and try and settle it before you come into court. Mm -hmm. But the courts are another form of commerce and they all make money off of it. And the more people coming okay. in, the more business they have, et cetera. So yeah. they don't do that. But some judges will do that. And that's mm -hmm. the appropriate way for them to deal with it. And that's a jurisdictional matter. You yeah. don't have jurisdiction to go to court until you've tried to settle it private. Well, you know, um, it was my opinion when I first started understanding the way that courts worked. Um, well, geez, if, cor if courts work that way, then all the judges must be corrupt. And what I found out as I went was something that you talk about a lot, which is about being in honor or being in dishonor. And many judges out there who, um, let's be fair to them. Well, let's not say, you know, that, that, that they're just entirely corrupt. Um, let's say they have, in a way, they have a right to, um, to many things that they do or, or opinions they might have of you if they believe you to be in dishonor lawfully. Um, and so that's something that we don't tend to understand is that in the court system, um, it seems that they highly regard being in honor and have a very low regard for being in dishonor. Like if you got a legal notice and you did not reply to it, they would see you as being in dishonor. Um, and there are a lot of judges and, and prosecutors and maybe lawyers in general who think that if you haven't taken the time to understand the law, it doesn't matter who you are. If you work at McDonald's, we don't care. We see you as being in dishonor. Um, is that something that's a general mentality in the court system as you've observed it? Ab absolutely. And uh, just quickly, there's, there's two things I wanna point out here on the screen. This is, uh, I, I did a series of what turned out to be three workshops uh, and I, I labeled them hope for justice workshops. And the first, um, <clears throat> the first course is uh, do common law courts exist? And it's about a, uh, a gentleman who went into court in British Columbia. He made the claim he was a natural person and he maintained that claim uh, through arguing back and forth with the judge. He actually had a judge who discussed it with him and the judge kept on saying, no, 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 but the guy kept on going. And ultimately the judge made an order that he was a natural person, which now that order is not giving him anything. That order is only putting on the record that the court recognizes him as being in that capacity. That's all it does. Uh, secondarily, it now, uh, creates that status for that individual for the rest of the case. So it creates, it, it acknowledges that status and locks it in for the rest of the case. Can't yeah. be changed from that now. So um, this Hope for Justice Common Law Courts exists, goes through the process of a common law court occurring, how it was created by getting its status recognized. And all the transcripts are there. And part of the course is me walking through the transcripts, basically line by line, explaining what the judge did, what he did, what he said, what it meant and how things have been misinterpreted, etc. 
So that whole process is there. And one of the processes in that is he stayed in honor. And he demonstrated his status. He didn't just say, I'm a natural person. And the judge goes, oh, okay. Because anybody can claim that, but there's something that defines a natural person. It's not just a human being who says something. It's a natural person of full capacity, which mm-hmm. is the real important part of being a natural person. Well, what is full capacity? One is legally defined as legal age, 18, 19, 20, 21, whatever it is in your particular jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. But beyond the age, even if you're 40, you may not be a full capacity because you don't know the difference between right and wrong. You're mentally incapacitated in some way, all right? So what he does during this process is he demonstrates he's a full capacity by making further statements. And I go through uh, those statements in the, um, I've got a couple of videos. Uh, This one here, Hidden Power of Private Person, goes through the definition of a natural person of full capacity. And that's three characteristics. Mm -hmm. You have to demonstrate you have knowledge. You know the difference between right and wrong. That just makes sense. And again, law is based on common sense. So again, you go back to the principle the law is based on and you find that common sense. And the common sense of a private natural person or a private person of full capacity is you have to have to know the difference between right and wrong. And so you now become liable for your wrong actions because you knew the difference between right and wrong. You knew it was wrong to break the law. So now you're liable for it. But if right. you're a child, you don't necessarily know the difference. So you're not liable. There's a, mm-hmm. you know, how the knowledge comes in. Second one is that you are responsible for your actions where you go, oh yeah, uh, yeah, I was the one who threw that ball through that window. I'm sorry, you know, so you take responsibility for it. You don't run away. And what a lot of people do when they get a legal challenge is they run away. So they demonstrate lack of full capacity by demonstrating lack of responsibility. Mm. And the third step is liability. Are you willing to accept the liability for your actions? Yes, I threw that ball through the window. I know it was, I know it was wrong, it was an accident, but it's damaged you and I'm willing to pay for it. That's liability. So what the judges are looking for in court and what the the entire system is looking for is to identify people who have the knowledge of right and wrong and their rights Mm -hmm. and the ability to accept responsibility for their actions and the uh, uh, willingness to accept liability for them as well. So the transcript of this gentleman having this conversation with the judge, which went on for over 45 minutes, them arguing back and forth, He actually makes statements where you can find he's acknowledging his knowledge. He's willing to take responsibility. He's willing to take liability. He does all that. It was only after that the judge uh, recognized him as a natural person. Mm -hmm. And then the trial that occurred, they moved him from one courthouse in one city to another courthouse in another city on the day of his trial. He shows up at the original courthouse and they ask him to go somewhere else. And they actually go somewhere else and they walk into a courtroom that, first of all, when they look at the, at the building, it has a Canadian flag flying on the roof line of the, court lo- of the courtroom roof line uh-huh. when it's never flown before and hasn't flown since. And then they walk into the courtroom and there's no judge's bench. There's no witness box. There's just tables and chairs on a flat floor. Mm-hmm. So because his status was recognized as a natural person of full capacity and the trial proceeded, they had to do it in a common law setting because common law was in play because they had a common law man there. Mm-hmm. And uh, people write it off because he was acquitted on a technicality. He never opened his mm-hmm. mouth in his own defense. The judge defended him two different ways and argued with the crown. And before the judge says, no, you never proved your case. Therefore, I have no choice but to dismiss it and uh, acquit. And this isn't going to help anybody. Nothing happened here. Don't look over here. Nothing happened here. Don't look over here. And people look at the decision and they go, oh, it's just technical acquittal. Well, uh-huh. yeah, but you have to look at everything that happened beforehand. And don't tell yeah. me moving, moving, moving courthouses, Canadian flag flying, and all the court paraphernalia removed doesn't mean something. Yeah. So that, that whole course yeah. talks about that. And, this, and the second course is um, hope for justice in action. And this is about conditional acceptance which is the process of saying, I'd be happy to come to court if you prove you have jurisdiction. That puts the burden on them to prove they have jurisdiction before you show up. Why should Mm -hmm. you show up if 
you know, that's in question. And secondarily goes into honor dishonor. And honor dishonor is just the process. And I, I to address it in, in the course itself. It's just, it's proper human communication between people yeah. that is duplicated and played out in the court system. Cause you got to think about this. This is the court system is just, you talk about the microcosm and the macrocosm. Yeah. It's just a macrocosm of the relationship between people. What do people do when they have a dispute? How do they settle their dispute? What's the proper way to communicate with the person you have a dispute with? Sure. So, you know, all of those things, if you take it out of the legal context, which people, you know, get all, you know, muddled about and put it down yeah. into a simple human communication context, it becomes a more relatable and hopefully be more memorable. And then mm -hmm. you apply those principles to the legal process. Yeah. And that's part of the idea with those two courses is to show that play out. And then uh, a course on, you know, how to learn to think in terms of conditional acceptance and honor and dishonor and practice it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I agree with, with much of what I've, I've gotten from you concerning um, honor and dishonor in a courtroom. And it's, the way that it echoes um, dynamics, maybe wherever you are in, in any kind of um, exchange uh, that you may have. And uh, as I said, I've been, uh, I've been in court enough times and had to go through uh, enough, uh, I, I'd say th th there were about three uh, decent sized cases in my life that, that I had to deal with. Um, and when I dealt with them in, in a very appropriate way, and I've seen guys that are just textbook inappropriate ways to deal with things, even if you don't know the language, even if you don't know the, uh, um, the letter of the law, um, you know, like you mentioned, uh, quasi criminal, um, we may not know terminology like that. But I, I have witnessed myself, if it's kept common sense, if it's kept simple uh, and concise, many judges will allow a, a great deal uh, of leeway uh, if you are conducting yourself in an honorable way. I've seen them, <laughs> I, I've seen people who really don't know anything uh, legal terminology uh, or, or any of that, but they were respectful and they wanted to know the answers to questions that concerned what was the nature of this case? Um, what were their rights that day? You know, things like that. They had no idea what they were talking about per se, but they were using the English language and they were being polite. They're being and that, honorable. And that goes back to the idea of it's basic good human communication uh, and understanding of how to deal with people. That is mm -hmm. all that's really necessary because yeah. the more you learn about the legal process, the more you're going down a rat hole created to distract you. Yeah. So keeping it human, keeping it on track with honor and dishonor, conditional acceptance, um, and, you know, understanding of very few basics is, is really, really good because people have a tendency to get too far into the details and then the details become distracting and confusing. Absolutely. And I that's agree. a big problem with everybody who studied so much is they know too much and they're confused. <laughs> and and oh. half, of what they, half of what they know is, as we talked about at the very beginning, off base because the principle was wrong. Yes. So yeah. it's trying to unspin all that. And the other thing is that if you take people who have no legal knowledge and you talk about conditional acceptance and honor and dishonor and stuff like that, then uh, you have to retrain them because we've been taught one of the principles of honor and dishonor is don't argue because yeah. when you right. argue, you're going into dishonor. And so we're trained to argue. That's we see it all the time in media, on TV shows. They're always arguing. Movies are always arguing. You know, families yeah. are arguing, et cetera, et cetera. So you learn that your normal response is to argue. But the honorable way to relate in a mature manner is to not argue. So how do you do that? 
how do you untrain your natural reaction to argue? <laughs> That's the trick. And we've been trained um, by the system to not know our rights, argue all the time, basically do everything wrong. Yeah. And so we have to untrain that and relearn the right way. Um, and it's, that's part of the, what's going to you know, ultimately change the system is when more and more people wake up to be more honorable and respectful, uh, you know, day to day. Yeah. Yes. That will help. Um, you know, I, I'm going to try not to, it, I'm, I'm going to take a page out of your book. I'm going to try not to get into any kind of, uh, complexities here and try, try to stay as simple as I, <laughs> I can. <laughs> um, because I know th the first thing is when when people go too far into complexities, um, as you said, and, and they're not paying attention to principles. Um, I, I've seen guys with entire series uh, available that that I can't I can't understand. But would one thing that you've you've talked a lot about is insignias and the language used on paperwork. You get something yes. in the mail. They're telling you, you know, we, we want you to go to court and here's the charge. And they state certain things on there, which may not actually mean what you think unless you pay attention to the signs. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that is before you ever go to court, you have that. You have a document you're presented with. And I think we should all at least know the basics of reading the signs uh, on a document. Sure. Uh, one of the principles uh, of the legal process is called notice. If they give you notice of something, then you have an obligation to respond or show up. And if you don't do that, as you mentioned, you go into dishonor and then they come after you because you've dishonored the process. So, yeah. but the first thing, the first step is notice. If you don't get that notice, and as a matter of fact, in that, uh, in that hope, for, uh, hope for justice, the common law courts exist, the first two transcripts, uh, the prosecutor's in court and the judge goes, well, did he get served the notice? And they go, well, no, he hasn't been served yet. Well, then we'll have to put it over another day. And that happened twice. So again, they can't do anything until you've got notice. Yeah. But once you have notice, now your obligation kicks in to respond or act in the proper mm -hmm. manner, whatever that happens to be. Now, when you get a piece of paper, the paper itself is notice, what it says is notice, Everything on it is notice in terms of what court they're bringing you into, which person they're bringing in. And that's done through the coat of arms, which is on the paperwork, the name of the court that's on the paperwork, the, the name of the person that's on there, what style it's in, style being all capital letters or last name all caps and or upper and lower case. So through their paperwork, they're giving you notice, not just with the paperwork, but how things on the paperwork are represented. If you see most paperwork and you look at the coat of arms, because the coat of arms is the authority under which that document has been issued, the law or the organization and the power it has. If it's got a coat of arms on it that looks like the official coat of arms, but isn't, then it's trying to trick you into thinking it's official. Mm -hmm. And by, by observing the fact that it looks like, but it isn't the official one, you now know they've given you notice. They're not bringing you into the lawful court. They're bringing you into one which looks like the lawful court, but isn't. And yeah. then you look at the style, the name of the court, and you go, well, is it match what the prescribed name of the court is in the law? And if it isn't, that's more notice that they're bringing you into a different court than the lawful one. And then there's your name. And if your name is styled in all uppercase letters, all capital letters, then that they're telling you. I call it advertising because it seems to be they're bringing you into a private commercial venue for this mm -hmm. whole process. So they're advertising to you where they're bringing you with the coat of arms and the name and uh, a name of the court and then your name, who they're bringing in. And if it's all capital letters, they're not talking to the man or woman in their private capacity. They're talking to a legal fiction, uh, corporate personhood. And it could be, there's all sorts of ideas as to what it is, Sesame Trust uh, or, um, it's an organization related to the birth certificate. There's all sorts of theories about it. And how you explain it is less important to me, the fact that they're not calling the man to me. So you just yeah. go to the basic. This isn't me they're talking to, this is an organization. But how am I, the man or woman, attached to this organization? How are they connecting me? That's what you need to understand. Yeah. And so if you end up uh, going to court, 
and you don't challenge any of those things, you've accepted the fact you're not in a lawful court under some foreign jurisdiction and uh, that you're representing in some manner uh, a corporate organizational trust entity, whatever it is that is yeah. indicated by an all cap name. So all those things are just waived and you're now participating in it. Yeah, and, and you, you should challenge all of these things before you ever go and get into a courtroom, correct? Yeah, you as, soon as, as soon as you get it, you challenge it in writing and yeah. you can do it through conditional acceptance. Yeah. And uh, the, yeah, the process is it's possible to challenge it. There are people who teach bond processes where they take the document into the registry and they ask for the bond that was that is on file related to the case and they mm -hmm. convert that bond and they close the deal, uh, close the, the whole uh, process um, through a bond process. So mm -hmm. there's there's different processes that are out there. And I've got some of that uh, first person telling the story. They actually did this uh, audio recording on the websites as well. So. I'm a little yeah. bit of an archivist where I'm looking for people who are who are doing good research, well yeah. backed up uh, research, and then people have real life examples, and I try and get first hand accounts all the time. So right. I teach a there's a webinar called um, uh, Theory of Everything, which is here's all the theories I've studied over the years, and here's why I think they all can work, but yeah. why they don't work often, and why what you need to do for them to work. And basic idea is there's lots of ways to deal with this. The question is, which one do you understand? Which one are you willing to actually do? And thirdly, which one are you willing to actually follow through with? Because many mm -hmm. people will learn something a little bit, give it a try, it doesn't work right away, so they abandon it. And then they try mm -hmm. something else and give it a half-assed effort and abandon it. And then you look like somebody trying to escape liability. Now you're not a full capacity and you should you know, get prosecuted to the full extent of their <laughs> <laughs> offense acts is the is their opinion okay you know the funny thing is if you just put if you just put some effort into responding to whatever that paperwork is and there's so many there 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 are so many resources now and you know probably a lot of them no definitely a lot of them are not very trustworthy uh i believe yours is uh i've looked at a lot of uh your articles and your resources and i've listened to you a lot and i think this is all very sound material um it doesn't take much to get the discernment for that you know but if you just use some some resources and answer that uh notice that comes to you whether you're whether you're right or wrong you have still done more in my opinion than than over 90 percent of people who might either ignore uh, or agree to their hidden secret code terms uh, and and go to court and proceed ahead uh, in in ignorance. So I I would say just responding to the to um, that notice, whether you're right or wrong, is far more than a lot of people do. Uh, yes, but it, responding isn't enough. You, you really need to uh, to have an idea of what you're responding with and why you're responding that way. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's not going to be of assistance. So yep. knowing knowing how to respond in basic principle. Again, everybody wants um, they want they want a, a boilerplate. They want to see how to do it and then just copy it and send it off. But yeah. what are you demonstrating with that? Are you demonstrating full, full knowledge, full responsibility, full liability? Or are you demonstrating the fact that somebody gave you something and you utilized it? And you probably don't know what it means. So what the system is always doing is they're adjusting to what we're doing. We're training yeah. the system to go back to the way things should be because we're calling them on all their crap. And yeah. they're actually modifying their processes to get back into more alignment. They are. Or or to manipulate further because they've been discovered in certain ways. They're so, using algorithms. <laughs> so when it, whenever, whenever they, yeah. So yeah. whenever they, they get a boilerplate letter they've seen before, they know they're dealing with somebody who doesn't know. Yeah. And so they'll just ignore it because they know that person won't, won't, do, won't, know, won't know what to do next. Yeah. And that's important is to, is to uh, if you've got a boilerplate, rewrite it in your own words. Because plain okay. language, especially if you're claiming private person, 
I'm not yeah. a lawyer. I shouldn't be speaking legalese. Right. So how do you say it in plain language? And I yeah. tell this to people all the time. If you're making an affidavit or you're writing a complaint or anything, what if you're sitting down across a table from a friend having a coffee, what would you say in your own words to explain to them your situation? Mm -hmm. As clearly and simply as possible. They've only got 10 minutes and you want to bring them up to speed. How can you simplify it? How would you speak it? And that's what you write. Yeah. You don't, you don't think about how to say it right. You just say it from the heart, explaining it in your own words. And that becomes the best sort of communication to make. And yeah. if you're not good with language and you're not good with writing, talk it into a, into a recorder and then type it out afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's you, the number it... one thing I've, I've helped people, hundreds of people with writing paperwork and affidavits and various other things. And the biggest issue is getting started. The biggest mm -hmm. issue is where, how do I, what do I say? And that's the first thing I tell people just put a, put a recorder on the table and tell your friend about it. Now you got that recording and that's your first draft. Mm -hmm. And and that gets people over that uh, you know fear hesitation of the unknown and all that sort of stuff. One 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 thing that was surprising is um, I've heard a few stories from guys who by the time I heard this story they had already been doing this for five ten twenty years plus, but at at the beginning, um, a lot of them actually got interested in knowing more um, about the law and about what their remedies and recourses of the law are because they responded to some sort of legal notice, whether it was uh, from a person, a court, the IRS, and they didn't know the law, but they understood principles. And they, they took that notice and very intelligently responded to that notice. Um, you know, it wasn't something that, that was taken from somebody else. Most of them didn't have the resources we do today. Somebody can go to your, your website and, and get a lot of resources today. This was, you know, this was 30 years ago or, or so. Um, but the thing is, um, it worked because they, they used intelligent language in a common way they addressed the issues. They understood what was being said to them. Um, like you said, there's them advertising. They want you to, to come into a, a, a commercial situation with them. They understood basic things like that, which I think people need to understand that. I, I don't think we can really go around being ignorant and think we're, we're going to survive in this system. I, I do think that there's at least a certain level, a mark that, that we're, we need to try to achieve, but they had success. Yeah. And that, um, that comes back to the full capacity issue. If yeah. you don't understand basic, uh, basic business function, and I'm talking small business, you know, how to say, how to, how, what are, uh, accounting books are like, because guess what? You've got a household budget. Yeah. Right. And, and how to deal with the basic legal things that come up. So yeah. we're not taught this in school. We're, we're, we're really trained to be ignorant slaves to the system. And uh, we don't have the basic skills of how to even run a household, never mind a small business, never mm -hmm. mind what you have as a legal entity, the all caps name. That's a business as well. That's the next step is learning how to operate that properly. But if mm -hmm. you've never learned how to run a business or run a household with all the things that go on with that, then you're going to have a challenge running your all caps name when you claim uh, how to do that. And again, there's different theories and processes for what to do. But ultimately, as you see on the sc screen there, uh, it's it's about how to know what that status is and to claim it properly. And then just because you claimed it doesn't mean they're going to leave you alone necessarily. You have to know how to defend it. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, my, my expectation when I started this was I claim my status, I operate with this way, and I'll be fine. Well, it didn't work out that way. They came after me. OK, yeah. and uh, then you have to learn how to defend it because you lose in court or with your paperwork process where they send you stuff to court because you have no clue what to do with it. And you lose by default because you don't understand anything about the process. So what I've tried to do is share my own experiences and other people's experiences in such a way as to give people at least a hand up or a foot up 
in uh, the basics of their status and of dealing with court process so it's not totally foreign and totally overwhelming. It can be overwhelming and it is far more complicated than it needs to be. But if you take it back to the principles and stick to the principles and don't get distracted with all the fancy theory stuff, um, you can do okay. Because the principles are the principles and they're always there and they always work. Um, and they may roll over you for a while while you're trying to uh, get the principles upheld. Uh, but if you stick with it and don't abandon it, you will be successful with those principles. And mm -hmm. that's what I've seen over and over and over again. They will try and ignore you. They will try and intimidate you. They will do things to, to get you off, whatever the point is, whatever the principle you're trying to invoke. But if you stick with it, ultimately, they have to back off. Yeah. Well, and you know, it, it never hurts. If you uh, if you have a day off during the week or you're out of work instead of watching the TV, going down to the courtroom and sitting there and listening. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in court, a lot of time watching, a lot of time in the well of the court, as they say. And mm -hmm. uh, the people that walk out of court with me, they have a totally different perspective and understanding of what occurred in court than what I had. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, that that's what I saw too. But this is this is what really happened. This is why the judge did that. And so, learning how to interpret what's going on in court is important because people have a lot of expectations that um, color what they're seeing and hearing, and yeah. they don't understand some of the process. Therefore, so they don't understand what happened. <clears throat> so there is a process of of learning about the game of court, learning about um, the process of court so you can you know have a better handle of of what occurred and again going through the hope for justice uh, do common law courts exist that's partly what that is is it walks through a court process and people can hear what happened and why it happened and and get a context so when you go to court and sit and watch you'll have already gotten some background on court process so you'll have a better use of your time uh, mm -hmm. when you go to court and watch it unfold. But yeah, it's, it's, it can be very interesting. It can be boring as heck sometimes, yeah, but it, it can, can be, it can be very interesting as well. Yeah. yeah it, it, you know, and in the, in the least, um, it can take some of that shock and awe away from the courtroom. If you happen to be one of those people who's in general, a normie, who's never been in any trouble and, and had to be in courtrooms, and all of a sudden something happens. And that's usually the way it happens is all of a sudden, and you're in there, maybe you're not going to be so intimidated uh, yeah. because you're a bit more familiar with the courtroom because people get very intimidated very easily in a courtroom. And I know that from firsthand experience. Yep. So. First time I first time I went to court was uh, back in the early '80s, and it was a speeding ticket. And uh, uh, I was sitting in the court waiting, you know, my turn type thing. And I had the shivers. I was yeah. shaking over my entire body, and I'm sitting there going, "What the heck? How come? How come this is so intense that I'm shaking like this? And I'm just in a courtroom mm -hmm. on a speed. I couldn't couldn't believe how intensely I was reacting to it. And um, uh, you know, now it's, you know, no big deal. Um, but there's been this progression where, you know, the next time I was in court for, for something was 20 years later and, or 15 years later, and there was similar type of physical reaction, but not as intense. And then mm -hmm. it got, it gradually, it went away, uh, over time where, you know, it's just, it's going to court again. It's not a big deal, but uh, yeah. yeah, you, you can expect to be, um, some, and I'm, and I'm, my brain goes, how have we been so trained or so traumatized that we react this way at the thought of going to court or of actually being there? Think about the level of control over the population because we're so afraid of the process and the yeah. idea of court. And, and, and again, that's another reason for the Sue wrongdoer is it's, yes, you can do this. Yes, you really should do this, not just for you, but for your family and society. And um, it's not that hard if you, you know, learn the basic process. Um, yeah. And that's, that's our remedy. There's, uh, you know, the idea is the courts were set up um, in order to give uh, people a place to go to settle their disputes peacefully instead of going to war or dueling, you know? 
or right. stealing and, and, and damaging each other's property in retribution. I mean, that goes on, yeah. you know, with certain types of uh, people out there in the world where they don't do anything but attack the other party who harmed them. And then it cycles over and over. So mm -hmm. there is a, a good, this is the other thing. People very often categorize things as all good or all bad. <laughs> and yeah. the principal reason is good. And the principal process is good. And the rules are generally good. The question is, who has taken that system and turned it into something that is being used in an abusive manner? There's a big sure. difference sure. between something being bad and something being used in a bad way. And I see that yeah. the courts are there to be used in the right way to protect our rights and to hold the system accountable. But we have to accept that as a possibility and then actually go and do it. Uh, and you, you, I, I have a Facebook page for Sue Wrongdoers, and the only thing that's posted on there is uh, lawsuits that have been settled or won, so that people see over and over and over again, it's possible to go to court and win. It's possible to go to court and you know sue a, a judge, a cop, a, a city, and win. Um, that that's our remedy: going to court. And yeah. uh, if we learn the basics, it doesn't have to be really complex. And if we have good evidence, because that's really all it's about, <laughs> is having good evidence and mm -hmm. uh, uh, understanding some basic process, and you can uh, achieve some some success there. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that's going to correct the system or other people from harming us is holding them accountable. Yeah. And the, the uh, civilized way, quote unquote, is um, through court because it does two things. It gives public exposure, which they hate, and yes. uh, potentially costs them money, which they hate. And yeah. with the system, uh, whether it's the police or the cities or anybody in the system, they're all insured or self-insured. And if they're insured, if they get a few lawsuits they have to pay out on, their insurance rates go, down, go up. Mm -hmm. And if they get too much, too many, they will lose their insurance, mm -hmm. okay? So there's multiple effects for making a complaint uh, through the complaint processes that is provided and through um, you know, doing a court process. And yeah. unfortunately, they're still fighting in the courts against anybody coming in there claiming private person status and natural person status because it's the most powerful status that exists and they mm -hmm. don't want us to have more power than them. And that is the status that has the ultimate power. You know, they talk about that the people are the ones who elect us and we, we're here because the people, we have consent of the governed, right? That whole thing. Yeah. Well, the principal idea is that's private persons and natural persons consenting to the government, but they've switched the game. So those statuses, those people's uh, understanding of those statuses has been buried. And what you have is you have fiction electors or fiction uh, voters the, the common law term is elector, and they take you from an elector status, which is your private status, and they turn you into a voter. As soon as you become a voter, you're now voting for the corporate government versus mm -hmm. the lawful government. So mm -hmm. um, when they tell – by the way, when they tell us a story, it's sometimes half right, sometimes 90 percent right, sometimes 10 percent right. But the bottom line is it is the consent of the governed. And when the governed wake up and go, just a second here, they're governing you know, legal persons – and uh, we're the reason we can't hold them accountable and they're ripping us all off is because that's the statuses. Well, if we go back to being private persons and natural persons and mm. act in full resp fully responsible, fully liable ways, then we get the proper government. No. There's an old saying that yeah. we get the government we deserve. Well, if we're not acting in our proper capacity, then we get that government. Right. So Correct. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, uh, Lysander Spooner um, in those uh, those articles that I'm reading currently, you know, he talks quite a lot about the um, the difference between what the Constitution says as far as rule by consent uh, and how they behaved uh, throughout history, um, the, the government in using the Constitution. But that principle does exist that and 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 they apply it a lot. This is by consent. Uh, unfortunately, and you're right, they don't do much to uh, educate us. That's true. But, you know, we have to do that ourselves. Uh, you know, a lot of people maybe want certain rights, 
but I think a lot of times they want rights without responsibility. And we have to exercise our responsibility. We have to think about, um, you know, not only the fact that we're responsible for ourselves. I guess that goes back to full capacity. We need to be responsible for ourselves. And I think we need to show some responsibility, if not for our fellow man, for our children and grandchildren. It, no, um, it's, it's all encompassing. You have to be a yeah. fully responsible member of society. If you want to come into society, and this is the way I talk about it, is in the, in the Wild West, uh, you know, it was an outlaw society, right? So yeah. you had you had the little community, little town, and then you had the outlaws. And if you wanted to come and live in the town, you had to agree not to shoot people and steal their horses and steal their stuff, right? Yeah. So you went from being an outlaw where you could do that, but you know somebody might hunt you down, yeah. And nobody's going to protect you because yeah, you done that, so they're going to come and get you. But right. if you're going to come and live in town, you have to give up the right to do all of that stuff. That's law of the jungle stuff. You've got to give up the right to do that and then agree to play by the rules of the town, which is I won't steal anybody's stuff and I'll treat people with respect and I'll say hello to them and you know be a, you know be a good member of the society. Mm -hmm. So you went from being an outlaw to being inside common law and you agree to play by that small loss of rights for the protection of the town and you're surrounding yourself with people who have agreed to play by the same rules. Where mm -hmm. would you rather live? Somewhere where everybody agrees to be, uh, you know, not taking stuff and not harming people or would you rather live somewhere where anything goes? Well, you know, not a big choice, I think. Uh, but some people choose to outlaw life. So um, the idea again is that microcosm, macrocosm, I go back to the basics. How did it start? How did it function in that wild west town? And you come into the community, you agree to play by the rules of community, or you're outlawed and you can't be in that community anymore, mm -hmm. right? So, but again, it all goes back to you need to understand your rights and your responsibilities. And your key point there was uh, about every right has corresponding responsibility. And without those responsibilities, you don't deserve the rights. That's what it comes down to. And that's the game, that's the, game the system is playing with us. Mm -hmm. is that we have we we're not a full capacity therefore we don't have rights that's mm -hmm. literally the game they're playing yeah and so uh yes you have to be demonstrate as i talked about earlier you have to demonstrate full full knowledge full responsibility full liability and then you'll get recognized and that's the trick is getting people there <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is uh it is but especially uh, if you look at twitter these days <laughs> <laughs> which i try not to do oh yeah. god i tell you i don't i'm not on twitter either but i, I see enough bits and pieces here and there just, i read some comments on videos i stopped reading comments on the videos i posted because a lot of my videos are posted yeah. only for free members they're not mm -hmm. available on youtube generally yeah. but I, I i read some of those stuff and i when i watch videos on youtube for whatever it is I read yeah. the comments the the level of uh, immaturity and, and, and cruelty and abuse. Yeah. It's just like, oh, my God. And this is another yeah. thing. People go, we should all be free. Well, hell no. Most of us shouldn't be. Just look at what they're look at how they're treating each other on Facebook and on Twitter <laughs> and, you know, at, at, at the local school and stuff like that. Those are the people who require, yeah. you know, outside rules and regulations and policies and procedures and offense acts because they're not a full capacity. No. And we, we need to move society, well, we need to. My idealized version is that we move society from where it is, going backwards in ways, uh, mm -hmm. to a more, I, I don't like the word civilized, but it's the closest thing I have at the moment, more civilized where mm -hmm. we there is more respect and there is more responsibility and stuff like that. Hopefully that's where we're going. And. Yeah. Uh, that would be yeah. good. Yeah, that would that be great. That would be good. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, I I think we've we've covered everything that I really hoped we did, which was great because it was kind of in a roundabout way. I wasn't sure if if I'd manage, you know, <laughs> to uh, if I'd manage on my end to at least show that there are these these great similarities, and and it was really you bringing up uh, principles. And sticking with principles, what are the principles of law? Um, and just have a little understanding. Um, do a little work if if you wind up uh, getting in a, in a bad situation. If you're worried about getting into a bad situation by surprise, maybe do some right now. Um, 
you know, it, because we all have some reading time and we all have a lot of time that we end up wasting on, on pretty useless things that aren't going to help us if we end up in a courtroom by surprise. Um, but I think everything that, that we've covered, that you've covered, has been really great. And, um, you know, I, for one, have understood it. I'm no expert in law. I, I just do what I can as I go. Um, so I, I want to thank you for for making these things more understandable than they were before we started. Um, is there anything is there anything else that you would um, I guess if 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 you had to tell somebody what you know somebody who who's not familiar with with law with courtrooms what well, what do you want them right now before they end up in a situation where they're in a courtroom by surprise and they don't want to be there what's the chief things that they should concentrate on now which will help protect them if they should end up there one of the key things is uh, don't poke the bear. I see a lot of people have worked with a lot of people who got a little bit of information about how they're getting screwed over by the tax man or the government or parking tickets or seatbelt tickets or whatever the heck it is. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> they get angry about it because they've been cheated and they've yeah. been lied to. And that anger leads them to attack uh, the organization or the individual uh, with uh, paperwork or with language or whatever and <laughs> you're automatically in dishonor and you're now an abusive personality that's given them permission to come down on you because of your attitude and your behavior so oh, no. uh, yeah and I, I call it the angry man syndrome and mm -hmm. some people you know move through it fairly quickly some people take a little longer and some people have lived there for decades and uh, you're never going to get anywhere with that attitude. It doesn't matter who you're with. Again, going back to basic human relations. Yeah. So if you learn you're getting screwed over, uh, that's one thing. But don't act until you understand it better than that and that you put it into more perspective. Because a lot of people are teaching angry man stuff. Yeah, and, they are. Yeah. And they're not teaching uh, a peaceful way with it. They're not teaching a, a, a contextual uh, way with it. Again, I see the courts as basically good. I see judges as having the capacity to be good. Not mm -hmm. always, right? There's mm -hmm. a difference between being basically good and having capacity to. I've yeah. been in front of really good judges who played the game the way it should be played. And I respect that a lot. And yeah. I've been in front of judges who from the first words out of their mouth were obviously there for political, you know, hey, and we're going to make an example. So there is a range. And so to put everybody into the negative box colors your perception, colors your thinking, uh, disables you from performing in an honorable manner. Yeah. So try and look for what's right. Try and look for the foundational principles that are right. Try and respect the process because, again, generally I think the process is good um, and not think it's all bad, not think it's all evil. That's the number one thing I see that hurts people. And um, yeah. Don't take an action until you if you understand it. So if somebody tells you what to do, um, many people don't try and do learn about something until at the last minute, and that's yeah. not an empowered way to deal with something because you can't get proper understanding. No. So yeah. the the negative, angry attitude is is the harshest thing, um, and it's justified for a period of time. But you got to get through that. Got to move yeah. through that. You do. Uh, yeah. You know, I think one of the best attitudes and. And this, you know, uh, I guess, depending on the things that you're finding out, there's all these permeations of understanding. And there is going to be anger that goes along with it. That's just natural. Um, the one thing I, I do strive for in, in all that I do and um, the negative con aspects of it and negative people in it, the one thing I, tr I try very hard to do is keep this idea of detached objectivity it's probably going to get me a lot further than just being angry. And especially because anger is an emotion. And if you're just being driven by that emotion, then like you said, those teachers out there that really should be teaching some, uh, you know, detached objectivity, but aren't, they're teaching anger and emotionalism, they're, they're going to get you in a lot of trouble. And you're talking about the court system. You're not talking about, um, you know, 
having an argument with your neighbor or or you know challenging something small you're talking about the court system you're talking about criminal court system in a lot of cases or, or the irs that's a big bear to poke and people do it yeah um so yeah. you know that's not rational that's not responsible <laughs> that's no, not full if, capacity. If, you don't if you don't understand uh, how to get out of the game yet just keep playing the game keep playing the game until you understand how to get out of it or how you can live outside of it and in many ways uh winning the game is playing the game but also having a private life i absolutely so there's, agree there's a, a balance there potentially uh i don't want to go live in the woods you know in a tent uh so how do i how do i exist in this in this world that has a mixture where common law still exists it still is respected but you've got to work to get there yeah and so how do you do that and once you're there how do you not step into the uh, fiction world uh whatever you want to call it um accidentally and then cause yourself problems so you have to understand there's two worlds and then ultimately the ideal is to be able to understand how to live successfully in both uh yeah. so that you can have a life and not spend your entire life fighting which is the other thing is if you're focused on fighting um that's one way to spend your life but i think there's other ways that you could do more interesting things sure i agree i agree 100 percent um well, on that, uh, I, I guess I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm thrilled, again, uh, that we had this conversation. Um, I've been wanting to do that for a long time, and, and I thank you so much for this. You're, you're always very gracious and, uh, and intelligent, and um, I want to invite everybody again to, to please go and, and visit your website, uh, whether, it's, um, whether they go to private uh, dash or hyphen person dot com forward slash blog. You mentioned that you have the uh, Sue Wrongdoers Facebook page also that, that they could take a look yep. at. And if everybody will keep in mind that you, like a, a number of researchers who offer a lot to people, a lot of your experience, a lot of your time, um, you survive in, in, in at least part on on donation the the goodness generosity of others um when i had to take time off of work for the the chemo and cancer treatment there were people that helped me they they helped me financially um just out of the goodness of their heart and and that was so appreciated um but you know you're doing something here that that is really empowering people so um i always recommend to people you know find something that that is a good thing where somebody's doing very good work, most of the time they're doing it for free on donations and help them out. Um, so I would encourage anybody that that sees what you're doing and sees the value in what you're doing to help you out um, and, and to go to your websites to get those resources, to, to become a member, to empower themselves and make the world a better place through these things. So. Great, thank you. It is a free membership at Private Person as well as Sue Wrongdoers. So the vast majority of the information is available for free there. So, you know, whatever precisely. whatever works. All right. Yes, precisely. All right. Well, thank you again, JD. And I, I hope we will talk again. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you keep up your work on uh, on the language stuff. I find that a very interesting subject. And it's a it is a part of the legal process as well as just general human human communication so i think it's cool what you do as well thank you you're welcome thank you